is your flame burning out or do you need to spark your attitude? I'm Cheryl Roush and I'm honored to serve as the District Conference Friday night with a keynote presentation on Sparkletude Fueling the Flames. I love the District Conference theme and it's Leadership on Fire and Saturday morning I'll also be presenting on that particular topic and I look forward to seeing you. So make sure to register soon for your Spring Conference. Good evening and welcome to TV Toastmasters. I'm so delighted you've joined us. We have a very special uh, guest tonight and I think you're gonna really enjoy listening to her. My name is Joan Lubar. I'm with Toastmasters for Speaking Professionals. We meet in Lake Oswego on Tuesdays, twice a month. And I'm here tonight to interview Judge Ziamara Torres. Very, very interesting story, and let's welcome her. So, Thank Judge you. Torres, I'm so delighted you're with us today. It's nice to see you. Yes, I'm looking forward to your sharing your journey with us. You're, you have a very unusual story, especially as a judge, so I think you're going to be able to share some interesting ideas and a great story for us. So I'd like to ask you, could you just start by telling your story of how you even came to the United States. Absolutely. Um, it was around um, the beginning of 1980. My family fled El Salvador. There was a, the very beginning of a 12-year civil war. And so um, we, my family hired what are called coyotes, which are people who help you safely travel through to get through the border. So my family flew into Mexico from El Salvador and then we had coyotes guide us through the Tijuana River. And then part of the coyotes, um, they drove us into the border. And so that's how I arrived to the States when I was nine years old. My goodness, that must have been quite a trip. Were you afraid? Were you upset? Did you know what was going on? I'm not quite sure. I mean, we were leaving the country I was born in. That's, that's I understood that. I, a lot of people had left because of the beginning of the war, so I knew we were fleeing. Um, in terms of whether what I understood to be happening in, in terms of us actually entering the country, I'm not sure that I understood all of that. I, I felt we were being assisted, we were being guided through. Mm -hmm. um, I could feel a lot of people were very nervous, so I knew it was dangerous. So now, was your whole family with you? My dad was already in the States, so it was my mother and my siblings. How many siblings do you I have? I have two sisters and one brother. And did you, didn't you split up to come across, or no? Um, yes, they were different coyotes. So uh, the actual entering, I entered with a uh, Caucasian couple, and I was the only child in the room, I mean, excuse me, in the car as they entered, and so my siblings were with other coyotes coming in. Ah, and then where did you go? We were at a hotel briefly in TJ until we met up with the rest of my family, and then home. Wow, and where was home? Um, in Los Angeles. Ah, okay, so you stayed in Los Angeles for a long time? I stayed in Los Angeles for about three years. Uh-huh. And then I unfortunately experienced abuse at home, and I was placed in foster care, and I moved from Los Angeles to Covina, and I entered into the foster care system. I had a few foster homes in Covina, and then eventually ended up in another foster home in Montebello. My goodness, that must have been so traumatic. It's a, you know, it's a big <sighs> challenge, I think, that um, foster children face of many placements, uh, disrupting and having to move and having to adjust to new schools, new friends. And you also had to learn a new language. Yes, when I came here when I was nine, I didn't speak English at all. Oh my goodness, so how did you learn English? Um, <laughs> I think you're placed in the classroom with <laughs> English speakers and you learn the language, you have to. So that's and, how I learned it. <laughs> and, and you ended up graduating high school in Los Angeles. Yes, I graduated from Montebello High School. Well, I, I'm not sure when you actually met the CASA person that I know helped you so much, but tell me a little bit about 
when you or when you met, I think her name is Jan, um, and tell us a little bit about how that affected your life and, and when she came into your life. Absolutely. So Jan is a volunteer, was a volunteer for many years, over 30 years, with what's called the Court Appointed Special Advocate Program, and its in, acronym is CASA. Mm -hmm. So she was a CASA, and she was assigned to my court case. Um, uh, to be, she's a volunteer, and to be like an extra set of eyes that keeps uh, the court informed as to how a child is doing in foster care. Uh -huh. So um, a judge actually, and now as a judge I have the opportunity to do that too, a judge decided that a CASA would be really helpful on my case. So he called up the office um, in the middle of a court hearing and said, can we have a CASA come in? And so I was testifying at the time, and she came in, I met her briefly, and she was there when I was testifying. And um, after that, she would show up to all my foster homes, visit me, and write reports to the court about how I was doing. And um, once I aged out of the system, somehow we just stayed friends. And so she has been this amazing role model and amazing influence in my life um, this whole time. And um, it has really inspired me to uh, once I graduated from undergrad, really inspired me to keep going, to attend law school, to look at my desire to help children and figure out how to channel that. Now, you kind of skipped over a few years here. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you a little okay. bit about finishing high school and then the decision to go to college. And before you tell that part of the story, is it normal or com uh, common that foster kids end up going to college and graduating and you know moving forward in their lives or is that unusual for the foster system sadly enough even i mean this was you know many years ago um this was 89 when i graduated from high school so sadly no uh, a lot of foster children do not go to college um, and i believe the statistics are less than three percent graduate from a four-year university so um, it's, it's rare, I would say. And I think from what I gather now, um, you even are able to share some of those um, uh, decisions you made to move forward and go to college and do become who you are. Uh, you share that with some of the people that you see in court, don't you? I do. I share with kids who are, I, I'm very selective as to when I tell kids that I was in foster care because, you know, it's, um, the cases before me are about them. Mm -hmm. And so it's really rare that I would interject and share about my life. However, there are certain points that I think it's important. I do it maybe when a child is moving from one foster home to another because I can tell they're very quiet. I can tell that's obviously a, a big challenge. And so I share that I was a foster child and that I also went through different placements so that they know that I know how difficult that I know how difficult that is to transition from one home to another and then uh, most of the time I share it when I have kids who are very close to graduating maybe they're missing two credits or maybe they're just seven credits shy of graduating and they're so close and so I tell them that I was in foster care I tell them um, that the statistics are very grim and that I need them to be part of my statistics and I need them to finish up and graduate because uh -huh. they're so close. So that's usually when I share, when I think it's um, impactful. Very inspiring for them, I'm sure. So tell us, how, what made you decide to go to college? Um, you know, my decision to go to college is uh, <laughs> tremendously unusual for most people. I uh, was aging out, I was going to be 18, at the time in California, there were very few programs about independent living. Mm -hmm. And so I had very little uh, idea of what living on my own would look like. I didn't know where I would live. Um, I really didn't have any concept of how to get an apartment or finances. And so the reality is that a lot of foster kids end up being homeless. And so I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And it just so happened that Berkeley sent me um, a letter UC Berkeley sent me a letter um, inviting me to apply to their engineering program and said, we want you to come here. And so I decided to apply to Berkeley. And I applied to other schools, UCLA. I was applying to one school back east. But my focus was housing. I need housing. And the, the biggest predicament I had was that the school would be starting in August, but I was aging out 
in the summer, and so I was trying to figure out what to do in, in the interim. And it just so happened that a friend of mine who was also going to Berkeley told me about this program that he was going to leave right after graduation to a dorm at Berkeley. And I was trying to figure oh. out how that was going to happen. <laughs> and he said, it's for at-risk kids, and you're not at risk. And so I actually called up Berkeley and said, whatever this program is, can I come? And so they let me come to this program. It was called Summer Bridge. Um, and it was, it was a program meant to ensure that um, students that they thought were at risk would do well in school once they started Berkeley. And so I joined that program, and that was the way I secured housing immediately from my foster home to the dorm. You're so clever. <laughs> uh, it was more survival <laughs> skills, I think, at the time. And it's interesting that they asked you to come in science, engineering. Tell me about that. How did they end up finding that you were, you should be an engineering student? Well, you know, the, the way that I've always, um, that I, at the time, escaped my reality was I studied a lot. And so somehow, um, apparently, during the mandatory testing that they do of students, I scored really high in math and science. And Berkeley figured that out, and that's why they were recruiting me. And it was also because of diversity, right? Um, yes, at the time that they were also trying to diversify Berkeley. Really interesting. It, things just fell into place for you, didn't they? And I think also diversify, I mean, I think it still continues to be a challenge, but women in engineering in general. Oh, that would make sense. Yes. And so, but some, you know, I remember talking to my college counselor once at Berkeley, and she looked at the scores, and she said, no wonder they were recruiting you. So um, that's all I know. And you decided not to be an engineer, obviously. <laughs> you know, I think I was misinformed about engineering and the social aspect. I thought of engineering as really people um, working mainly with numbers. And I'm a pretty social person, so I knew I needed a lot more social interaction. So I was looking for a field where I would have a lot of um, contact with clients, contact with people. And, and so I didn't perceive engineering to be that. But I was wrong. I've actually met a lot of engineers where there is a large social <laughs> component of engineering. Oh, good to know. <laughs> so what about um, your decision to go to Berkeley? So now you decided to go to Berkeley, and what did you want to major in then? Initially, I started uh, psychology. I wanted to be a psychologist for children. That was initially my first idea, so I took some psychology classes. And then um, I actually ended up, I had danced since eighth grade, so I ended up doing a double major with dance and sociology. And then towards the end of my years at Berkeley, uh, it was, I think the last, I quit one year short of the dance degree because I really wanted to focus on sociology and m having really strong grades because I knew I wanted to apply to law school. Okay, so you, by the end of the, your college years, you knew you wanted to go to law school. I did. And how did you choose your law, law school? Um, Again, you know, I was looking at the different schools, um, and actually a friend of mine at Berkeley, she was doing a graduate program at Berkeley, um, her name's Karen, she was from Portland, and she said, I think you would really like Lewis and Clark, you should look into that school. And so I did, and I loved the campus, and um, primarily I was really attracted to the fact that the majority of Lewis and Clark's uh, law graduates go into public interest, and I knew I was really interested in public interest law. Well, that's great. Now, we're going to take a break for a moment, and um, we'll come back and talk more with Judge Torres about what she's doing today and some of her beliefs and, and where she's working toward. But right now, let's take a break. We'll be back. Hey, PJ. Yeah. Who's the keynote speaker going to be for the annual conference this year? The keynote speaker at the Leadership on Fire conference will be Cheryl Rausch. She is a distinguished Toastmaster and accredited speaker. She has a program called Sparkletude, which she'll be doing on Friday night. You may come in there kind of feeling down. You will be sparkling by the time she's finished with you. Right. The next morning, she's going to do the keynote speech for the Leadership on Fire conference and the 80th anniversary for our district. One of the suggested gifts for an 80th anniversary is oak. She's going to be putting some big logs on that fire and building a fire under our district leaders. All right. That's why I'm going to be there, and you can be there too if you go to the link below and register. 
How do you engage an audience? It's one of many things you learn about in Toastmasters. You can engage them and bring them in with a great opening question, a compelling message, a statement that wakes them up, action, gestures, voice. There are so many ways and you learn all of them in Toastmasters. Because if you don't engage your audience, what's the point? They're not going to hear your message, they're not going to respond, and you've wasted some time standing up in front of people that aren't listening. So you need to grab them, bring them in, and tell them what you're gonna tell them. One of many things you learn and improve as a skill through Toastmasters. Welcome back. I am so delighted to have you back again because we're going to continue our conversation with Judge Torres. And there's lots more to this story, so it'll be important. So, Judge Torres, you now have finished law school. What happened? How did you decide where you were going to work, what you were going to do? Well, my last year of law school, I was an intern for a federal judge, Judge Anna Brown, and um, I applied to be a clerk for the chief criminal judge, Judge France in Multnomah County. So I spent about two years really watching this, um, these two amazing women be judges as I was trying to figure out what my first role would be as a lawyer. And I was able to observe a lot of lawyers coming in and I was really impressed by, by lawyers who represented children um, in dependency and in the family law matters and in delinquencies. So I applied with one of those law firms and I ended up doing that for four years. And I also represented parents in child abuse cases. And then after four years of doing that, I applied to the Attorney General's office and I worked with the Attorney General's office um, for over 10 years. And um, while I was there, I noticed a lot of my colleagues applying to be judges and um, when I first started out as a lawyer, I was a lawyer on a case um, that had on the other side um, Governor Brown. She was a lawyer for children in between sessions. And so one time she just said to me, you know, you should really think about becoming a judge. So that seed had been planted. And then when I was at the Attorney General's office, I was, again, seeing people apply. So I decided to apply. And I applied three times and eventually was appointed. Third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And tell us what court you're in. Multnomah County Circuit Court, downtown Portland. And you work with the family court, is that right? Yes, when the positions are posted, when a vacancy comes up and you interview, interview with the governor's office, um, it's general bench or the family law bench. And so uh, in, Multnomah, in Multnomah County, the family law cases are designated to the family law bench. And um, so I applied Whenever there were spots on the general bench, I would not apply to those. I applied primarily to the family law. Well, obviously with your history, there's a lot of reason to really want to help kids and Absolutely. families. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit more about what that means to you and um, how being a family court judge, uh, you feel like you're contributing to the world, to our county. and and really making a difference? Well, I think that when I was working at the Attorney General's office um, and advising Department of Human Services, I always remembered what one of the Attorney Generals said to me, and that is that um, we represent the citizens of Oregon, not necessarily an agency, and um, like a greater good. And in my mind, family law, the greater good is children, no matter the types of cases that you have, whether it's uh, juvenile child abuse cases, or ne child abuse neglect cases, or whether you are doing a divorce case, ultimately, and a lot of the divorce cases, if there are children involved, ultimately, um, the most important person in that case is the child and how a child will be impacted. And so to me, um, there's so much more, um, to, I mean, all the decisions that a judge makes are important, but to me, those, part, those cases, I think, have um, sometimes a young child that um, really needs you to have very informed, very thoughtful decisions for um, the families. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And do you feel like you also are being able to help others on their journey? And what would you say to them 
if someone came up and said, you know, I'm not really sure where I'm going in my life and um, tell me more about your journey and how I can, you know, what I can do to move myself forward. Well, I mean, I think that as lawyers, we um, are always striving to help young lawyers, young law students, and so I do a lot of mentoring and talking to students as they're trying to figure out what area of law will be the perfect fit for them. Um, but also just also foster children. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are um, mentoring opportunities everywhere. And um, I was really fortunate to have someone who really um, mentored me and was able to guide me. So I try to, as much as I can, um, just check in with law students and um, kids that are coming into court with me just to see what their thoughts are about the future. I have one last question for you. One of the things that I know you didn't talk about for a very long time, understandably, was your own story. But there was an event that I think you saw that prompted you to want to be more honest when you, not about your true history when you went out and did speeches. And can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Um, yeah, some of it was honestly, um, I kind of just stumbled on it. Um, what happened was the Oregonian wanted to do a profile about my life when I became a judge, which they routinely do. And it was just a simple question. They simply asked me where I flew into when I flew into the <laughs> States. And I didn't have a passport that was stamped a certain way, you know, and so I told them that I crossed the river. Um, but certainly I could have given a very vague answer. Um, I don't know that people had ever, er, ever asked me that before. Um, and it's not something I had ever volunteered. And, um, you know, I had watched, like I think a year before, I had watched um, DACA students uh, on TV and they were protesting in LA. And they were protesting because they wanted an opportunity to go to the university and get an education. And so they had these shirts that said, um, I'm illegal. And I was blown away by that because w watching young kids, knowing that they could be deported, um, protesting because they wanted a right to an education it was really, in my mind, extremely courageous uh, to want to go to school so badly that you put yourself in that position. Um, so it really struck me. And so here I was, a brand new judge, and I thought, you know what, um, I can take some of the shame that people feel from coming to this country as uh, an undocumented person, particularly a child um, that comes to this country um, without documents. I can take some of that stigma away. And uh, certainly I thought there would be some repercussions. Um, someone could run against me in the election and I could face a challenge. And so I was prepared for something like that. No one did challenge me during the election. Um, but I, that's something I considered. And in fact, the Oregonian, after they did that story, they um, said to me, you know, if you change your mind, we can kill the story. So I, once I started interviewing with them, I realized that this could have um, a positive, it could have a negative impact for me. Mm -hmm. And so I was aware of that. And, but I thought, you know, if those kids could talk about what it was like to be undocumented and possibly face deportation, then I could talk about it and not have that stigma that I carried with me all those years. Wow. Very brave of you as well. Thank Very you. courageous. Thank you. N last quick thing I just thought of uh, in terms of citizenship. How did you get your citizenship? How did that work? Absolutely. So I had been, um, so I was a temporary, you become a temporary resident, then you become a permanent resident, and after five years of ah. being a permanent resident, you're eligible to be a U.S. citizen. I um, had been eligible to be a US, citi for, U.S. citizen for quite some time. I just hadn't done the paperwork. You feel a tremendous attachment to your birth country. And 9-11 um, happened, and I was interning with Judge Anna Brown. And somehow she found out that I wasn't a U.S. citizen, and so she sat me down and urged me to become a U.S. citizen, uh, talked to me about um, the constitutional protections of a U.S. citizen, and we were at Miss you know, the mm -hmm. after effects of 9-11, sure. and she um, 
instilled in me how important it was for me to do it. So I did it the next day. I applied the <laughs> next day. And that's how I became a U.S. citizen, was at the urging of Judge Brown, which I'm forever thankful because you can't be a judge if you're not a U.S. citizen. That's true. So <laughs> yeah. I, And also, she, you know, um, it, it does, um, it's a very important step. Sure. Well, Judge Torres, I want to thank you so much for oh, joining you, us Joe. tonight. I'm so impressed with your story and the thank work you. that you're doing. And I hope you all have really enjoyed this. I, I'm just thrilled myself that I was able to be able to interview Judge Torres. Please join us again for the next TV Toastmasters. These are wonderful interviews that we're doing, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Hello, my name is Michael Nataro, and I was the 2011-2012 Toastmasters International President. And I have a question for you. Where will you be on April 24th and 25th, 2020? Well, I hope that you will join me and scores of other Toastmasters at the District 7 Spring Conference. We are going to have a great time. We will be on the campus of Warner Pacific University in Portland, Oregon. Why do you need to be there? This is the 80th anniversary of District 7. We'll be celebrating eight decades of helping members become better communicators and leaders. And we need to have you there. I'll be delivering a speech entitled The Call of the Leader based on my new book. Have you heard the call of the leader in your life? Have you discovered the call of the leader? Embraced the call of the leader? Fulfilled the call of the leader? I'll be talking about all of these things during my speech, and I hope you will join me at the District 7 Spring Conference. See you there.